How about we pray as we seek to get through a challenging bit of Scripture? Father, this is a serious and weighty issue that we're dealing with as we consider the return of Christ. Would you be gracious to us tonight as we come together, as we gather together to hear from your word and apply it to our lives? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, you may not know this, but back in 2012, uh, a man named Harold Camping predicted that Judgment Day would come on May 21st of that year, 2012. And national news in America began to pick up uh, this story, and then soon after, international news picked it up. And I'm sure Australia had a report or two back then. Now, Mr. Camping started uh, uh, spending years investing in this radio broadcast uh, that he was building up, this radio empire. And he was broadcasting his message around the world into 30 different languages. Some of his followers sold everything they had, houses and cars, and they all waited as May 21st, 2012 approached, and then as it passed. The narrative was sadly so damaging to the Christian message. People in many parts of the world who, who really didn't know any better associated all Christians with this man and what he believed and what he taught. How sad that in light of all of that press coverage, the narrative became uh, the fact that life goes on as it always has. Uh, the sun will come up tomorrow. The days will carry on as they always do. That's hard because we as Christians can believe and trust that that day will come. But false teachers like Harold Camping will only help promote the idea that what Christians expect is, is silly and it is fantasy. I think he actually died the next year in 2013. But tonight as we continue our series on the second coming of Jesus, we look at its delay. Now there's no doubt that Christians will think about the second coming of Jesus when we are pressed from every direction, when we are going through a, a crushing circumstance, when we are facing a, a major crisis in our lives. But honestly, how much time do we actually spend thinking about the second coming? I've struggled with this as I've considered what this means. Because on the one hand, I would love to move from this world of pain and suffering and hurt and frustration and chaos and sin and all of its consequences and, and, and move into a world of, uh, without any pain and without any tears or sin or personal loss or emotional loss. On the other hand, it makes me consider the people I know who have yet to accept Christ, the people who I know need more time. I'm sure you can all think of a few of those yourself. It's like what Paul says in Philippians about being torn between being with Christ, which is better by far, and the work of ministry, which is so important. Then on the third hand, I also get caught up in the day-to-day -day affairs of life. I don't intentionally consider the second coming. But then there are those who want to stay here because they think that they are more comfortable here. They, they have all they want and need and desire and they want to live as long as possible. There's no strong desire to be with Christ for eternity. But as we saw last week, we can be certain that his return will come. He himself, Jesus Christ, has promised. 
But we have to remember that his, his second coming will not be like his first coming. His second coming uh, will be a time for the believer's redemption. The, his second coming will be a time of judgment. His second coming will be a time for Jesus to reign and rule. His second coming will be a time for his people to reign and rule with him. His second coming will be a time for us of seeing loved ones that have gone on to the Lord. Our second coming, His second coming will be a time for believers to receive their rewards. The second coming will be a time of joy and great glory. And it's a day that was such a longing expectation of the early church. That's why they used to greet each other with this word, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. But of course, the devil, back then, as he is doing even right now, because the devil knows that when believers live their lives in the light of that second coming, they will live faithfully. They will work diligently. They will demonstrate spiritual zeal. They will live in the joy of the expectation of the Lord's return. They will be purifying themselves with that hope. And you don't have to have a more college degree to know that Satan hates that. So what does he do? Well, he gets the church to discount this important teaching. He gets us to focus on this life only. Uh, he will get many to deny the reality of the second coming. He will place uh, skeptical and false preachers in pulpits. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter responds to these false teachers of his day regarding that joyous second return of Christ. Peter is presenting that second coming as a, uh, a future factual event. And he's saying, you church, you keep that return of Christ at the forefront of your minds. I'm writing you this second letter with the purpose of reminding you that this great day will come, and so meditate on it. I don't know about you, but I am more and more convinced that the battle in the believer's mind takes place between the ears. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at Romans chapter 12 and, and considered that the ongoing transformation of a person happens through the renewing of the mind. So don't listen to the mockers and the scoffers. Don't listen to the skeptics. Don't listen to the deniers of the truth of the Lord's return. Instead, ask the question, what is their motive in denying or pretending that the Lord's return will not happen? The second half of verse 3 and in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18 as well, Peter answers that for the scoffers of his day, the real reason that these false teachers deny the second coming is because of their own lusts and sensuality. What does that mean? Because of their sensuality and their lewdness, their sexual gratification, they hate the thought of divine judgment. They give themselves a, a license to pursue all sorts of lustful desires that their heart desires. So much so that they hate the thought of future punishment and they resent any hint that they will be held accountable for misleading of people into sin. And the opposite is true. The faithful believers, the faithful believers who are living in the expectation of the return of the Lord, they purify themselves. They feel uh, incentivized for holy living. They are encouraged by the reward for their faithfulness. And in verse 4, the attitude or the argument of the false teachers towards this return of Christ is this. You know, people have been saying 
that Christ is coming back for 2,000 years and yet nothing's happened. Everything keeps going on as it always has. Jesus is not personally coming back to take his believers away. Heaven and hell are just a state of mind. Verse 5, Peter is calling those people scoffers. Why? Because they deliberately ignore the fact that God is separate from the universe, that he is in control of the universe. And Peter gives us three responses to the scoffers. His first response is that God creates and upholds by his word. You see, the scoffers discount two monumental historic events. The first historic event is the creation. Creation took place by God's word alone. God didn't need a pre-existing material. He didn't need a, a blob of chemicals. He didn't even need a long period of time. God always existed, but his creation of the universe marked its beginning. He is the one that spoke it into creation, into being, into reality. Peter said God created the earth between two areas of water, that same water he used for the flood of Noah, which brings Peter to the second event he mentions, which is uh, the great flood. That is when God let loose that water and flooded the earth. He created the world, he sustains the world, and he controls it merely by his word. And he can use his creation to accomplish his will. Verse 7 says, By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Just as in Noah's time, the final day of judgment will be for those who reject the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those are heavy words. The final day of judgment will be for those who reject the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we cannot forget that the Lord will deliver his own out of the world before he unleashes his final wrath. God creates and upholds by his word the second response to the scoffers, God is infinite in his existence. Verse 8, Peter is saying, don't forget that a thousand years in the Lord's sight is but a day. He's quoting Psalm 90 verse 4 here. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Peter is saying, don't ever forget that God's perspective of time is much different from that of humanity. Finite people cannot confine an infinite God to their time schedule. The day of the return of the Lord was appointed in heaven long ago. That is why when Moses asked the Lord when he came as a burning bush, he says, who should I say sent me? He did not say, tell them that I was sent you, for that would make him only the God of the past. He did not introduce himself as uh, I will be. That would make him only the God of the future. But he said, tell them I am sent you. I am means that he has no beginning and no end. I am means that he brought creation into being and he will be the one who can bring it to an end. Peter is saying that we are dealing with the one who is not divided into past and present and future, but he is infinite in his essence. He is absolute in his dominion. He is ultimate in his power. He is transcendent in his glory. And he is our heavenly father in whom we can trust. God creates and upholds by his word. God is infinite in his existence. The third response to the scoffers, God is merciful in his patience. 
Verse 9, Peter supports his teaching on the second coming by appealing to the character of God. The thrust of his argument in verse 9 is this, the reason Christ's return is not immediate is because God is patient with sinners. God is waiting due to his graciousness, due to his long-suffering. It's not because he's indefinite or he's powerless or he's even distracted. No, it's the opposite. Because he is merciful and he is forbearing, he delays so that elect sinners may be saved, may come to repentance. Now, I know there's a lot of confusion about this verse. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Right? I'm sure some of you have had Bible studies and it gets confusing. Is this talking about uh, God's basic disposition towards man? As in, uh, God does not delight in the death of the wicked or the punishment of evildoers, uh, yet he still issues their punishment. Uh, But his doing so is almost like a just judge sentencing his son to prison. He doesn't do it with great joy. Or is this talking about God's uh, perceptive will, like his law, which he, he creates and sets in place, and yet we still break it? Or is this talking about his sovereign or what we call his decretive will? Uh, Whatever he wills must come to pass. I think that's the one that's used here. I think it's this sovereign will, this decretive will. Whatever he wills must come to pass. How? Why? Because he says, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Some translations say because he is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. And the any or the anyone is referring to the you or the us. And if I haven't confused you or I've just confused myself, let me explain. Peter is saying God's will is that none of his elect will perish but come to repentance. He starts out his uh, second uh, letter, uh, his second letter here with his introduction to who he's writing to, right? Verse one, and and Simon read this at the beginning. In, In verse one, he says, to those who through righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received faith. In verse 3, again, which was read for us, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. If you've missed all of that, he will not destroy the earth and come in judgment until the full number of the elect are saved. But how do we know who that is and where that is? That's why it's our objective to proclaim the good news, because we don't know who's elect. What an act of mercy. What an act of patience on God's behalf. Three great responses to scoffers and three helpful reminders to believers. Our God creates and upholds by his word. Our God is infinite in his existence. And our God is merciful in his patience. Judgment is very real. But so is mercy. And Peter concludes his argument in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. There are a number of ways to describe uh, the return of Christ and the judgment, but Peter uses words of destruction here, emphasizing that everything will be burned up. Why? Why does he do that? Because... It shows the fruitlessness of what the false teachers are proclaiming. You may have heard things such as, um, Christ isn't returning, therefore do whatever pleases you. 
you do you. Uh, there will be no judgment, therefore live it up. There's no consequences. You're just going to go into the grave and nothing will happen. Peter says, everything will be laid bare. Most people try to find meaning in life by building something that's not just here today and gone tomorrow, right? We strive to overcome this sense of finiteness by producing something. And so some people build equity and they get a sense of uh, power and success uh, by looking at their wealth, their portfolio, their home, their car. Uh, some people build these uh, professional reputations through skill and hard work, nothing wrong with that, but then they get a sense of this power and success from their heavy responsibilities and their numbers of people that look to them for leadership. Some people build uh, artistic expressions and they exult in what they have created. Some people do more simple things like hobbies and they collect stamps and coins and seashells and whatever it is you collect. But they gain this sense of superiority from the size of their collection or the richness of their garden or the, the shine on their car, or the wonders of their computer. The false teachers in 2 Peter lined their pockets with money. They elevated themselves above authority. They built a reputation as great interpreters of Paul's hard letters, and they gave themselves to sexual depravity. And Peter's response to us and to them is that it's all going to be destroyed. It will all be burned up. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, then what kind of people ought we to be? What are we, what are we supposed to learn from this? So what? Now we know that the Lord will return, and now that we know that uh, He will not return until all of His called ones uh, have, have responded to Him, and we know that all that is temporary and worthless and all those things will just pass away, then what should we do? Peter says we are to live holy lives. Meaning what exactly? It means that we live as people who are set aside for God. You are set aside for His use. When your tongue is set aside, you will bless and not curse. When your money is set aside, you will Use it for God's glory and not frivolously. When your time is set aside, you will spend it serving and encouraging and uplifting others, living a godly and holy life. But you also live your life expectantly of that return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not preaching perfection, but rather our sanctification, that process by which God is conforming us more and more into the likeness of His Son. And we submit more and more to His will and His authority in our lives. There are two motivations that God gives us for our sanctification. One, that the earth and all the vain accomplishments of man are going to be burned up and only the fruits of holiness will remain. And two, that the promise of the new heavens and a new earth will shine so brightly with God's righteousness and glory that how can we not walk in the light? There's a story told of how confident a believer was in regard to the Day of Judgment. His name was Colonel Abraham Davenport. That's as American as a name comes, I think. He's the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the 1700s, 1780. On May 19th of that year, the sky in New England turned completely pitch black 
and this blackness extended all the way up to Canada. And people began to panic, for they didn't know why the sky had turned black. Finally, they discovered the cause of it, and it was this massive forest fire that had taken place. But to the vast majority of people at that time, they thought that it was the Day of Judgment. The House of Representatives was meeting in Connecticut, and many of the representatives wanted to suspend the meeting because it got to be so dark that they couldn't even see without electricity. They didn't have electricity. And so they couldn't even continue to do the business that they were sent out to do. And many of them feared that the end of the world was at hand and they wanted to go home. So they shouted to the speaker, adjourn this meeting immediately, adjourn this meeting immediately. But the speaker was so confident in his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that he replied, I will not adjourn the day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, then there's no need to adjourn. And if it is, I choose to be found doing my work. Therefore, bring candles. I want to conclude my message the same way that Simon finished last week. I want this to serve as a, a warning to those who delay and put off making a decision. Don't ignore this reality just because you think avoiding it makes it go away. Remember, his delay doesn't show his inability. It shows his mercy that he's giving you more time. And a decision on Christ must be made because a decision a non-decision is still a decision to reject Christ. Please take this seriously. As I said, judgment is very real, but so is mercy. And for the believers, take advantage of the mercy that God is giving to others and to us by being his instruments telling of the love and the mercy and even the justice of God. And let this serve as a reminder not only of how you should live and act, but let it be a reminder to us of how wonderful that day will be with Christ. And with that in mind, live the life that you were called to live. Let's pray. Father, as Ned prayed earlier, you are the one who set time in motion. You've created by your word. All is yours. You appointed the day your son came to earth to live and die and rise that we may live forever with you. And you appointed the time when he will return, not with a message of hope, but with words of judgment. May everyone who hears my words put their saving faith in the only name that saves, in Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. For what a great and terrible day that will be. But in the meantime, will you use us as you draw us nearer to you and as you draw the lost to yourself? May we never lose sight of the reality of the second coming, even though it delays. For we pray this in the only name that can save, in Jesus' name, amen.